Hi, and welcome to Learn from the Experts, presented to you by the Women Business Owners Alliance. WBOA is an organization made up of over 100 women entrepreneurs from the Pioneer Valley. And we're here today with some experts to share their expertise with you, our viewers. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'm Kim Shagnon, owner of Kim's Upholstery, and I'm here with my co-host. Hi, I'm Susan Allen from Susan Allen Financial, and today we're interviewing Alexis Johnson from the International Language Institute, and we have a few questions for you. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, we wanted to know, um, well, first of all, I wanted to know as far as learning a language, is there any age that's really optimal to start learning a language? Can you learn at any age? You can learn at any age. Uh, obviously, the younger you are, the easier it is because you're not even thinking about it. You're just doing it. And as we get older, the walls go up. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what, what, wait, what's that in English? And people <laughs> want to translate. And if you start by translating, it's a crutch that you'll never be able to throw away. Also, when you're younger, you naturally um, have an accent, you, the accent of the language that you're studying. When you're older, okay. it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. There are some that are easier than others, and I can go into that if you're yeah. interested. Yeah. yeah, what are the easier um, languages for English speakers? Well, one of the most phonetic languages is Spanish, and we're very mm -hmm. lucky because that's the language in this hemisphere that if you need a second language is the most uh, optimal. Mm -hmm. And it's a very phonetic language. What you see is it's a, the sound spelling correspondence is almost exact as long as you know the vowel sounds are a, e, i, o, u, right? And you never say you and it's ga, go, gu, and he, he. You know, once you know those things, you can read anything. You can pronounce anything that you read and mm -hmm. you could write anything that you hear. And I often tell my, we work with adults and I'll say that it's up to them because interestingly enough, we have 13 sounds, vowel sounds in English and there are only five in Spanish. Yo puedo hablar español con un acento terrible, pero todo el mundo me puede entender. Now, as long as we don't have to repeat that. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yo puedo hablar español con un acento perfecto y todo el mundo me puede entender. So I say, which did you like better, number one or number two? And they say, well, number two. I said, but the thing is that if even with that we gringo accent on the first one, mm -hmm. people will still understand you. And they won't laugh at you. They'll mm -hmm. just realize that that's your accent. Okay. Unfortunately, when Spanish speakers or other uh, speakers try to speak English as, as adults, it, sometimes the accent is much more difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people are not very patient and it, it's just it's much more difficult. So I say you've got, you have the choice. You can speak any way you want, but you can have a good accent if you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here are the, the tricks or the, 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 the rules and it's very phonetic. So I highly recommend studying Spanish, any language. I've studied many, many languages. I love them all, mm -hmm. but uh, Spanish is a good a good, place to a good place to start. Yeah. Plus, there's a lot of opportunities just to practice it with it being Absolutely. on TV. There's a lot of access. Right. I you guess. can it's eavesdrop. Right. You can buy magazines <laughs> over the counter and almost anywhere in Spanish. You can watch uh, on TV. The Spanish channel, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about the methods you use? How do you, where do you start? Well, we're passionate about this. Um, Janice Rogers and I started the school 30 years ago, and Carolyn Gear, who is Direct, school director and I have been doing this together. We're like an old married couple now. <laughs> and we are passionate about methodology that engages the student. You know, I don't know if you studied languages in high school or Yes, college. many and, years ago. And <laughs> was it the kind of thing where the teacher would write, yo hablo, tu hablas, yes. él habla, and it's like the class just sits there and watches the teacher do all the work. Right. So we say lazy teacher, active student. Of course, the teacher does a lot of work behind the scenes, but the teacher facilitates the language learning. So mm. I want to get from you, if you see there are patterns, and I want you to be thinking about this. I would rather you learn from her than from me. And when we get our students working in pairs and working in small groups, then the teacher will go around monitoring. And it's amazing what you can do with only even 10 hours of Spanish, you can really have conversations. Mm -hmm. You are not going to be fluent and you're not <laughs> going to be perfect, but then perfection is highly overrated. I right, think. that's <laughs> true. Well, that's great. Now, are there any languages that are really difficult for English speakers? I've heard Chinese before. Is that? Well, Chinese, I've studied Chinese mm -hmm. and um, the characters, I would never attempt to learn the 
to write in to Chinese. Write I might do a few a few characters because mm -hmm. they're kind of universal. You know, you can oh, I can recognize that. But the grammar is very easy because there are no tenses. So I go to the store today. I go to the store yesterday. I go to the store tomorrow. You don't change the verb, which okay. in every language they're either conjugated or they're irregular and they're just a, a, a nightmare. The difficult part of Chinese um, are the tones. There are four tones. So uh, ma, 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 ma could mean rice, dog, mother, or I forget what the fourth one is. Oh, so that's wow. a big difference okay, between so. I want some rice and I want my mother, or I want a dog, you know? <laughs> and so that's the most difficult part for, mm -hmm. for most people in Chinese. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're really young, you can hear that naturally and you can start to imitate it. Um, but as you're older, it's a yeah, little more difficult. Now, what's this about like the male-female thing? A lot of the languages have that, which I know English does not. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, English. Or do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's why people use they when they should be using he, she. Oh, um, okay. Mm -hmm. because it's grammatically incorrect, but that's okay. We want to. We don't want it to be <laughs> sexist. Most languages are sexist, and in Spanish, for example, we would say nosotras. We are sitting here. One man sits down, and we should say nosotros. Okay. Because mm -hmm. so I say, like to say, well, nosotros is the general term, but women have an extra term <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. if they just if it's just women and it's nosotras. Um, but times are changing. Times are changing, and it's interesting the different words that are coming into play in different languages. So, mm -hmm. so what we'll advice see. could you give someone that wants to learn a different language and doesn't doesn't have a specific one in mind? But where would they start? At the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would recommend a class mm -hmm. because. Um, and I would recommend that they they ask about the methodology. Um, and it's interesting what people will say. Well, what is you want to hear the word student-centered or learner-centered? You want to hear communicative. You don't want to hear conversation class necessarily because if you know nothing of Spanish, for example, or French, or Italian, or German, you can't sit down and have a conversation. You have to learn some grammar and vocabulary, and of course, you're going to have conversation right from the beginning, the mm -hmm. very first class that we offer you walk out of there being able to say things. And I'll bet if I said to you, me llamo Alexis, ¿cómo te llamas? Susan. ¿Cómo te llamas? Kim. <laughs> Yo estoy en uh, Northampton High School. ¿Dónde estás tú? Right? You can understand what I'm saying because mm -hmm. I'm speaking in context right. and a lot of repetition. By the end of the class, people are saying, my name is this, where do you live? I live here, I work here, where do you work? Um, I don't speak Spanish. Oh, do you speak Spanish? You know, they can have a nice little conversation, yeah. which will serve them. And that's the thing. You don't want, we, we wrote our own books, and they're just a guide. And we don't sit in the classroom with everybody looking at the books. Because, no, that's to take home. That's to do at home. You want to use the language. You want to maximize your time in the class. You don't want to be listening to the teacher constantly. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be looking at it. You want to be using it and playing with it and feeling confident with it. Um, and uh, making mistakes, that's OK. And um, having fun. I want to hear laughter coming out of the classrooms. People are tired. It's after work normally. And uh, the roads are a mess. And they <laughs> couldn't find a parking space. And so I like to hear, like, what? It's time already? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's music to my ears. Right. Um, That's so great. I really recommend that you, um, the people, investigate where they're going to be learning and make sure that it is a student-centered, and not as one time, one of our teachers went on a uh, an accreditation visit because we were accredited by ASSET, and um, he said he asked the director, "Well, so what do you mean by student-centered?" Oh, well, the teacher stands in front of the class, and all the students are centered on the teacher. No, that's not what student-centered <laughs> means. But and at any rate, you want to make sure that um, you're getting that type of, uh, interaction. of interaction. interaction. My 11-year-old my niece is studying Spanish, and I just I cringe when she yeah. asks me to translate this or that. And I, and I said, what, what, what is your assignment? <laughs> and funny. it's really it's sad. It's mm -hmm. really sad because she spoke Spanish as a baby, and it should be coming back to her now, and it's not. And it yeah. makes me very sad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I wanted to thank you for joining us today, Alexis. You're very welcome. And thank you. Thank you to our viewers. We'll be right back. And if you'd like to get more information about Alexis Johnson, you can visit WBOA.org and get the information on the International Language Institute. Thank okay. you again. Thanks. Thank you. To our second segment from WBOA. I'm here with my co-host, Ida. And Ida, can you introduce yourself? Yes, hi. I'm Ida Tassinari with uh, Real Living Real Estate Professionals out of Westfield, Massachusetts. And thank you for having me. And for the second half of Learning Things at Any Age, we have with us Claudia Gear. And Claudia, can you tell us the name of your business? It's named after me. It's oh, Claudia good. Gear and Co. LLC. My tagline, though, is helping smart people become outstanding authors. Oh, great. Okay. And what do you th would you say is the first step into r for writing a book, and what prevents people from doing that? Hmm. Okay. That's really two questions. Let's okay. answer the first one first, which is, what's the first step? Mm -hmm. One of my biggest fears when I work with a first-time author is that they're going to write the wrong book. Okay. So it really takes time to think about why are you writing this book? Mm -hmm. Because one of the hardest things is selling it. Okay. You can write a book, but if you don't have an audience to sell it to, okay. yeah. why would you write it? Mm -hmm. So it, you have to think it through first in terms of what the book is going to do for you because you have to go out there and market it. Nobody's going to market it for you, mm -hmm. even if you get a traditional publisher. So okay. really think through why am I writing this book? And how am I going to sell it? And, and then the other one is, why don't more people write their books? And I'd like to start with that, an interesting statistic, which is okay. a, a survey done by um, USA Today and mm -hmm. the American Publishers Association said that 82% of our population would like to write a book someday. Wow. 82%. That's a lot. That definitely yeah. is a lot. Yeah. So why don't more people follow through and actually write them? The most common reasons I get are time. Mm -hmm. We all have definitely. way too much to do. And if you have a book sort of idea sitting there, it's one of the easiest things to push off. So mm -hmm. people really need to think about where they're going to write the book, how they're going to write it, making time to write it. And then the second one is, how am I going to fill all those pages? True. Sure. <laughs> the average book is around 240 pages. Wow. And that's mm -hmm. around 65,000 words. That's a lot. A lot of words. Mm -hmm. And then the third is probably the sad one and the, the most wrong reason, which is, what do I, what do I have to say? Who would want to listen to a, or read a book about something that I have to say? Mm -hmm. And that to me is the saddest part when people just don't have the confidence to write a book. To write it. Because I really mm -hmm. think that everyone can write a great book if you really think about what the book is going to do for other people. What are the benefits that, of what you have to say? Mm -hmm. Would you feel that um, fear is one of the reasons that keeps a lot of people back from deciding to try to m write the book that, of their life? Absolutely. It, and that's so unfortunate because no matter who you are, you have incredible stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And it's a person's stories and a person's experiences that make every book different and every book valuable. And what would you say the, is there a time frame that if they started, it would be a year, a six month project, or what, what, is there an average time frame that someone would take to write a book? One of the things I've learned working with so many different authors is that there are as many different ways to write a book as there are authors. Mm -hmm. And the people that tend to get their books done within a short time frame are the ones who really make a commitment of time and space. So they have a place where they write and they have a time that they write. Also, do you have people that are still old school, pen to paper, without doing it digitally? <laughs> I, one client I worked with, and we spent a year with me transcribing everything and putting it on computer and editing everything. 
the way he finally finished his book, because he was a polisher, 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 was to sit at his kitchen table and hand write the entire book and then have his wife retype it into the computer. And it was that handwritten version that, made him that he loved. That mm -hmm. he, right, the process. The, it was not just the process, it's how his mind connected mm -hmm. when he was putting things on paper. And a lot of times I find that it's how a person has worked in college mm -hmm. doing papers, how a person works in business doing reports, that same framework of time and space where they're doing it, how much time they allot, very similar to writing a book. Hmm. And then, of course, the, the people that take a complete uh, left turn, and if they're mirroring what, they, mirroring what they do at work, doesn't work at all. They have to do something completely different to write mm -hmm. the book. And what are some of the things for first-time authors that they, you know, maybe mistakes that they think it's going to be one way, or what are some of the things you find that is a difficulty for them? Well, we already talked about the danger of writing the wrong book. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is just to, that first-time authors often underestimate how difficult it is to sell a book. So okay. I really want people to be clear what their market is and how the book is going to support their goals, whether they're personal goals or business goals. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people will go into the idea of writing a book to make lots of money. And that is absolutely the wrong reason to write a book because okay. <laughs> only 2% of the books that are published make 90% of the publisher's profits. Wow. Okay, and here's mm. another statistic. Only fewer than 2% of the books published sell more than 2,000 copies. Wow, that's amazing. So it's a small amount of books that are really propelling yes. everything? Right. And the traditional publishers want celebrities and mm -hmm. tried and true authors, so it's hard for a first-time author to get in the door. But if you are a first-time author, that is actually one of your best shots of mm -hmm. getting a traditional publisher. Okay. But you have to be careful to write a book, and this is again to the mistakes, that really looks publishable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's what I offer in my course, is really to, to help people understand that how a chapter has to open, how it has to close, how a book has to flow. What are the essential elements of a book mm -hmm. that make it look professional rather than done by an amateur? Mm -hmm. And the other biggest mistake is not to get an, auth an editor. Okay. And it's, and it's difficult to get the right editor oftentimes. Mm -hmm. I had one person call me just a few weeks ago, and he said, Claudia, I think I have the most grammatically accurate pile of... Mm -hmm. <laughs> because he didn't get the right kind of editor. Uh -huh. He needed somebody who could really tell him about the organization and the structure of his book, that could do wordsmithing and give him some real substantive editing. Mm -hmm. And what he hired was a copy editor. So he has perfectly punctuated, spelled, capitalized information, but it's not a professionally written book yet. Okay. So it's getting the right editor, but making sure that you aren't putting it out with millions of typos. Mm -hmm. No, we don't want that. And what about a title? How do people go about picking out a title, and does that make a, that big of a difference? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> Good question. Like judging a book from its cover? Yeah. <laughs> it's one of your biggest sales tools. Okay. Um, and people get cover titles stuck in their head, mm -hmm. and they think this is the greatest title <laughs> they, that they've ever heard of, and this is going to sell their book. Um, breakthrough. Okay, breakthrough. That's the title of the book, but I don't know what it's a breakthrough about. Or, um, and then you can have a title like "How to Measure Your Thumb for a Bowling Ball." Okay, now it's limited market. Very limited market. Yes, and as you can imagine, the book is very short, but it tells you exactly what the book is about. Right. Okay. You, you need to have, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of having too much time on my hands. <laughs> so at one point, I examined the 
best-seller nonfiction books for the past 20 years. Wow, okay. And trying to distill what they all had in common in terms of their titles, and I distilled it down to three different ideas. And one is that it has to be catchy. Mm -hmm. So book titles like Freakonomics that just sort of grab you in, mm -hmm. uh, pull you in, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, titles that leave you wanting to know more about what the book is about. Okay. They need to be concise. The fewer words you use to describe your title, more time for you, the secret to peak productivity, because they have to be repeatable. People have to remember them. Mm -hmm. And then they have to be compelling. You want them to make you want to buy the book. So what would your final words be on this subject today about writing your own book? Well, my best advice is if you want to write a book and you have doubts or you have concerns, is to look at a lot of your favorite books and look at what they have in common. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to be a lot more successful writing the kind of book that you like. The other thing is, you don't have to start with a long book. Start with a short one. Start with a little tips booklet, 10 ideas for running your business, 10 ideas for having a real estate, uh, putting your, book, your house on the market okay. for faster sales. Well, Claudia, I'd like to thank you for coming today. It's been a pleasure, and I hope our viewers got some tips and some ideas on how to develop and start your own book with Claudia Gear today. Thank you thank so you. much.